I'm actually really delighted to um, introduce our speaker today, Robert J. Gleshko. <laughs> Most of you know him as Bob. Um, Bob has been uh, on our faculty since 2002. Um, but beyond that, he has over 30 years of R&D consulting and entrepreneurial ex experience in all the areas that the iSchool works in, fortunately. Information systems and service design, content management, electronic publishing, internet commerce, human factors, and computers. Um, Bob has founded or co-founded four companies, uh, including VO Systems, which uh, pioneered the use of XML for electronic business. Uh, VO was acquired by Commerce One, uh, and he worked there uh, heading their XML architecture and technical standards activities and became an engineering fellow in 2002. He also co-founded Document Engineering Services, an international consortium of expert consultants and standards for electronic businesses. This is, I'm learning stuff, you know. This you didn't is, know all this? Yeah, I didn't know all this, you know. I did know this one, though. Bob was a member of OASIS, the board of directors of OASIS, which is the international consortium that drives the development, convergence, and adoption of open standards for the Global Information Society. And he is currently on the board of directors for the Open Data Foundation. Uh, he's also president of the Robert J. Glushko and Pamela Samuelson Foundation, which spo sponsors the annual Rummelhart Prize in Cognitive Science. Today, Bob is going to speak to us about the wider community of iSchools, the challenges presented by their differences, and also the overarching principle of organizing systems that all of these schools, in including the UC Berkeley School of Information, share. I'm really delighted to have Bert Bob speaking today. He's Many of you know that he's working on a textbook in this space, and I think it's going to be a really important contribution to the field. With no further ado, over to you, Bob. Well, thank you. Well, I'm uh, really pleased for the invitation to speak today. Uh, I'm very happy to see at least one PAC student here, because this really is for people like you that I did this work. Uh, because I think you're the most important part of the audience for this talk, because you'll be the crusaders who bring this message to the other iSchools and, and when you go off as an assistant professor in a few years. Uh, it's nice also to see um, the, some of the MIM students, especially uh, some from 2014, who I'm teaching now in the information organization course, uh, because many of them are serving as kind of the crowdsource, finishing the book people who are contributing critiques and proofreading and graphics, because I don't have a right brain. Um, and they're otherwise contributing to the finishing of this uh, discipline of organizing book I'll be talking about today. And it's especially nice to see uh, Bunny and Rochelle, I saw her some, yeah. Because there are master's alums from previous years who, in fact, helped start this effort a couple years ago uh, by writing draft chapters of the book uh, that were built on my course lecture notes, and today co they're co-authors of the book that will be coming out in a few months. There's 12 co-authors that I have, and uh, most of them are master's students at Berkeley. Um, see if this new toy works. Okay, so my, my talk today, um, uh, this, this book cover is designed by another master's student here at Berkeley, Jen Wang. Okay, so the, the, my topic today will be talking about the motivation of this project, for the uh, discipline of organizing. I'll talk about the concept of the organizing system, which is this sort of unification of uh, information organization and information retrieval. I'll talk about design patterns for organized systems, which is a new way of thinking about the traditional categories of organized systems like libraries and museums and scientific data collections. They're just design patterns on a multidimensional space, uh, which is a more generative way of looking at uh, designing organizing systems. And finally, a multidisciplinary project like this lends itself to uh, electronic books because you want to find ways to customize the delivery of the material for different disciplinary emphases. So I'll talk a little bit of the project to do that and how that's in creating a kind of a, a platform for collaboration among the iSchools uh, who are using this book already before it even exists. So uh, I've been teaching the Gateway course, the first required course, uh, for entering master's students here since 2005. It's called uh, Information Organization and Retrieval, but that was already a legacy out-of-date name when I picked up the course in 2005 uh, from two other iSchool professors. Uh, because I began to teach both halves of a two-part course, instead of having two people teach, I realized that it needed some kind of uh, rethinking to be more 
conceptually unified, and that led me on the first down the road here to think that there might be a better way to think about this than just information organization and information retrieval as separate things. The second driver of the work I'm describing today is the uh, emergence of the iSchools Caucus, which is about 40 schools. Um, and you look at the iSchools uh, website. Oh, of course, it has to do this. The iSchools Caucus website. And uh, it's remarkable in the diversity of the schools that call themselves iSchools. You can see that there are different kinds of programs that they offer, different kinds of degrees they offer. Uh, they're basically uh, have way more uh, differences than they have similarities. But they do share the brand of being iSchools. Uh, and so the problem is they have a kind of circular definition. We are iSchools because we call ourselves iSchools rather than in terms of any kind of necessary or sufficient characteristics that make them have something in common. So I've been trying to look past this and what is it, we can, what is it they have in common despite all these other things which they have different. Uh, now that in some ways is a good thing because it means that every school can sort of have its, its, its particular constituency and de emphasize its particular distinctive competencies. Uh, and they're all interested in the intersection of information and people and technology, but that's kind of vapid to be honest. I mean, what is the intersection? That just defines it almost like in. Well, those are the words, but what does it really mean that, that they have that intersection? And it causes real problems for us because it means you can't really compare things across schools very well. It causes confusion for potential employers of our graduates across the I caucus. It can, causes great confusion for uh, the I schools identity within, it, within their university home. They don't know where to put them. Are we sort of journalism? Are we sort of business? Are we sort of computer science? Are we sort of whatever? Uh, and of course, it causes real assimilation challenges for new PhDs who have to go off to an alien place and teach something which they never were taught in some ways because they're going to a school which might be more library science, you know, more informatics, and you might have been taught something very different. So there's this kind of missing intersection that is, you see it reified most strongly in the core course that I've been teaching where you have uh, very different kinds of emphases of these 40 schools and what they teach their entering students. So, uh, some of them are more library information science oriented, where they teach information organization, information architecture, public sector kind of uh, uh, information system design. Or there are some which are more computer science or informatical or entrepreneurial like Berkeley's, uh, which treats more, has more systems approach, more business and technology content. So there is an intersection there of those things. And uh, it's often described in terms of trade-offs like this one, uh, that you can invest in organization or you can invest in retrieval, but you don't have to do both because they kind of trade off against each other. Or we can make similar observations about the trade off between a business perspective and a nonprofit perspective. But while those are important observations, they don't really tell us what is unifying about this. They say, well, there's these trade offs between different kinds of emphases that the schools have. And so my quest was to say, well, is there a way to teach all this stuff in a coherent way where there really was? A, a defined intersection. Those things really became first class parts of a, of a course that we could use. And if I could do that, then I would have defined the intersection of the I schools. So that was sort of the quest I started when I said, let me pick back, if I think, fix the Berkeley course, what would be the thing that would make the Berkeley course make sense to me, teaching two halves of a course rather than, as one rather than two separate halves? And wouldn't that framework then, of course, be useful to the I schools more largely? So, uh, when I looked at what the schools actually did and what their graduates did, I saw they actually had some things in common. If you looked at it abstractly enough, they did organizing. And you could look at what they organized, and they organized things, physical artifacts. They organized information. They organized information about things and information about information about things and so on and so on. And there's this, all these different combinations of organization, and there's going to be some common themes there. And my quest was to find, them in, to find that in more than a kind of hand wavy way, saying, well, there's intersect. We all do information. Well, but really, what do we do? And I wanted to define it in a way, kind of as a computer scientist might, in terms of design patterns, and say, what, is it that the, what are the design patterns of organization? So we could have a common intellectual core while still showing how those design patterns could realize in different domains so to preserve the diversity of the schools while having an intellectual core of the schools. So if you look at organization, we have institutional organization at the level of libraries and museums and businesses, business data, scientific data, 
other kinds of institutional collections of resources. We have uh, different kinds of document organizations. We organize a very wide range of documents from narrative ones to transactional ones. They have characteristic structures, content, and presentations. We can use to organize them. And of course, we all organize things in our personal lives, our kitchens, our closets, our personal computers, our, our smartphones. Okay? Some of us organize kitchens and closets more than others. And that's, again, there's preferences and trade-offs. Okay? But again, the point is that organization is a fundamental activity in every discipline, but they, people look at it differently in different disciplines. So library and information science has traditionally studied organization from a public sector bibliographic perspective, paying attention to user needs, uh, requirements for access and preservation, with a more prescriptive philosophy about do it this way, here's the standard way to do it. In contrast, computer science and informatics have tended to study organizing in the context of information intensive system design. Uh, business applications will often focus on efficiency and architecture implementation, kind of a technological perspective. And my goal was to have a more abstract way of thinking about this that would apply equally well across that space of disciplines. So, we know what these things are, just we never thought about them abstractly enough. So we know this is the, the library here at, at uh, one of the libraries at Berkeley, Bancroft Library. Many of us have been to the museums, uh, like the Louvre in Paris. Archives are repositories of important document collections. We have web-based versions of those kind of collections with, with digital libraries and search engines. We have stores that organize uh, goods for sale. This is the Safeway Rock Ridge aisle where you buy your toothpaste. But you have the, the online analogs of these kind of retail establishments like you have it at Amazon.com where you organize not just goods but also business services behind this. Like this is a drop shipment choreography where you have warehouses, uh, catalogs, banks, and delivery services which choreograph their activities by sending documents around to be a business model. That's an organized system of, of web services behind this store. We have real-time information organization, things like the stock market, like the sensors in, in vineyards, the Napa Valley. Um, we have our personal document collections. This is when I was doing my taxes. I leaned over the desk and said, there's my document collection. Idiosyncratic but functional for me. We, this is my iTunes collection. Janis Joplin rocks. All right. Um, and we have our things like stamp collections. So that's a very wide space of things we organize. And we can say, well, they're so different. We might as well just go home and not study them the same way. But I think we can look at the commonalities rather than their differences. How do those different kinds of collections differ? Yeah, they do. But how are they, are they similar? What do they have in common? And what they have in common is that they are all organizing systems, which I'm defining as a collection of resources that have been intentionally arranged to enable some set of interactions. And my goal in this lecture today is to introduce this new framework with enough details to be able to see how it spans and synthesizes these different uh, uh, domains and disciplines that converge in the iSchools. And then to present some of the design patterns that we can that reveal when we take this perspective. It hasn't made an impact on the iSchools. Well, then the iSchools don't know what they're ignoring. That is correct. Exactly right. I read Elaine Smiloni as she talks like this, but in a very narrow domain slice. But remember, it was never that narrow, not in information science. I agree. I agree. But it's never been applied that way. Never. OK. So this is a depiction of an organizing system saying that uh, we have some intentionally arranged collection of resource, and you see that there's an interaction which can be, can be uh, supported. Those interactions can be done with different kinds of agents, uh, human agents as well as computational agents, agents in acting individually or acting in groups, acting passively or acting actively. So resources in this definition are anything of value that can be support goal-oriented activity. That's a very kind of business or economic kind of, of motivation. Um, but if that's what we are organized. That's why we have things, because they're worth saving. They have value to us. Okay. And they, they, they have value to do something with. Okay. We don't save things just for the sake of saving them. We save them because we want to do something with them at some later point. And the collection is a group of resources that have been selected for some purpose. Now, a collection is also a resource. And so computer scientists told me 
You don't need it. It's logically unnecessary, the concept of collection. Because, of course, it's abstract recursive. Of course, we can see what the collections are. They're just resources. But the concept has such deep historical and contemporary value in many parts of the iSchool domain that it's important to keep it as a, as an, a, as a first class concept. Intentional arrangement uh, captures the idea that uh, organizing systems require explicit and or implicit acts of organization by agents that can be human or computational ones. Um, and these arrangements follow one or more organizing principles. Again, this is also, we have to be very careful with these definitions of the core concepts here because our field has been repeatedly vitalized and paralyzed by debates over the definition of information. And there, uh, uh, none, these are a sort of subtext here. Information can exist without intentionality. Uh, so, for example, the Grand Canyon conveys a lot of information in its, in, its, in its appearance, but it's not an organized system because we cannot identify the intentional acts and the principles in the way that would cause it to be repeatable as a design pattern. Uh, similarly, I think it's important to talk about organizing principles as a kind of directive for design in this kind of intentional way because we want to express it in a way which is abstract or logical that doesn't constrain its implementation. Uh, that again, that's a very common way of thinking in computer science that the sort of uh, three-tier model, we separate the implementation from a business logic tier from an inter interaction tier. It's less common to think that way in other parts of the, of the uh, iSchool domain. It's important to think about the principle of organization separately from its implementation. That's really easy to see in your kitchen. So if I said, let's organize our spices alphabetically to make them easy to find, it says nothing about where they're actually physically located. Okay? Because the principle specifies an abstract directive. And how it's actually realized will depend on the environment in which the, or the technology context in which it's applied. So we want to consciously focus on this idea that there's principles which separate from implementation. So that's a very important concept that we want to apply more aggressively in the I schools, where we often focus too much on, on implementation. Um, in the physical world. Now, interactions uh, I define as any activity, function, or service that's supported by or enabled by with respect to any individual resource, by the resources as a whole, treated as a collection. And we can think of we can, a litany of interactions uh, access, reuse, selection, copying, transforming, translating, mixing, remixing. You can name all these ones. Anything a person or agent could do with a set of resources. But again, it's important to focus on those which are directly supported by the organizing system, which we designed in, rather than those which are available because of the affordances of the resources. So if I take a book from the library, I can take it home and read it and translate it. But that wasn't supported by the library. A digital library might have had a translation service, which we could, like a digital translation like Google Books has. So I could say, translate this book into Chinese. That would be a service provided by the organizing system. So I'm going to distinguish those that are designed and those that are available because of the affordance of the, the resource. And finally, I want to emphasize the idea that there are activities that span all organizing systems, if you look at them abstractly enough. We, we select resources. We organize them. We support or design resource-based interactions. And then we maintain the resources over time. How explicit these and systematic these activities are depends on the scope, the number of resources, the scale or breadth of the organized system. Again, this is not a new idea because everyone does it in their domain, but they don't talk about this abstractly, and that's the point. Okay? So um, I can think of, of depicting this. There's resources. You select them. You then organize them. Then you maintain them over time in order to support these interactions. Um, Think of your closet. Closet did not, you know, but there, you don't sit there with a collection plan, selection plan, maintenance plan in your closet. But you do those things, or your closet wouldn't look like this. Okay? You made some choices about should I hang up my sweaters or should I put them on the shelves? Should I sort my clothes by color, sleeve, fabric, season? Do I need separate places for dry cleaning and laundry? I'm designing interactions to be easy or hard. I can either have a pile of clothes on the floor and say, well, I'll do it at one time. Or I can have and do it at design time and have a bundles for lights and darks and dry cleaning. 
Okay. Now again, this is not a new idea in some ways because people talk about selection and collection development policies and maintenance and other things, but they use domain-specific words and they cause them a domain-specific perspective on it. So collection development, appraisal, selection, uh, cataloging, indexing, organizing, uh, acquisition, accession, ingesting, integration, uh, incorporation, insertion, deletion, purging. You can think of lots of synonyms here. They have disciplinary focuses. But if you have broader words, more abstract words, you can have conversations between disciplines we could not have before. That's what I'm trying to enable here, cross-disciplinary conversations. Again, it stretches it sometimes to use words which are broader than you're used to. Resource in the library, most people are okay with that. Resource on the web, of course, a universal resource identifier. Resource in the zoo, well, we've organized them intentionally to support certain kinds of interactions. I can, I can itemize the principles of zoo organization. Okay? So, again, that's, the, that's, I've thought about this a lot because I've tried to, to do this the bottom up way and try to do it less abstractly, but it's hard to have conversations across disciplines without an abstract language. So we have to have a kind of a, a, a tongue that says select, maintain, organize, rather than the disciplinary specific words. Let's look at it another way. How do we organize organizing systems? We can classify them by the type of resources, the resource domain. We can classify them by the dominant purpose, by who created them, by the community that uses them, other ways. So for example, I could say, well, I have collections of books, collections of art, collections of documents, collections of data, collections of spices. Organize them by the type of stuff I'm organizing. And there are literally thousands of different types of documents that we organize this way. We have uh, different disciplines that range from the creative writing on the narrative end of the document type spectrum to these transactional ones on the other end. Uh, and there are literally hundreds of different names for document types. If you count different schemas for data and documents that you might have in a database or uh, a business system, you might have literally hundreds of thousands of different named document types that are out there being used. Each of them represents a different organization of information based on different requirements uh, for interaction and use. But we could, and we, again, the examples, this is uh, Moby Dick, a good example of the narrative type document. We have a semi-structured type in the middle and we have transactional ones on the other end. Very distinct document types, very distinct organization principles for the different purposes. We'll also categorize by purpose. There's a very interesting contrast between Organized systems which preserve resources almost as a means and those that do it as an end. So the memory institutions, so-called, preserve stuff because it's important to preserve stuff to make it available over time. Libraries, museums, archives have preserved important resources that we need to preserve over time. Businesses preserve information because it keeps the business preserved over time. There's nothing fundamentally important about an invoice, but if you have no invoices, then you can't stay in business. So you have to have the sort of means and ends differences in the purposes of organizing systems in important contrast. Again, many more categorizations are possible. The point is that they, they are different. They overlap without clear differentiation among them. You can't say, well, which categorization is the best one? Well, they all were necessary. That means they're all, in some sense, confusing uh, all of us. What's a library? This is the main sleeping room, I mean, the main reading room at the Bancroft Library. Okay, we've all been there. Uh, this is a library too. This library lets you check out seeds. You go home and plant them, and then you bring back the children if they were better. Good idea. It's preserving uh, heirloom species of plants. This is the same thing, a seed library for knowledge. You check it out, and if you bring it back, they think it should, you only bring it back if it's better, if you've improved it. But they're not really libraries, are they? Because they violate one of the defining features of libraries, which is that you, you borrow and you return the thing you borrowed. So if we try to define a library, we say, well, there's a 
collection of resources organized to enable access and reuse for the public good. And you can think of a lot of other kind of, I'm going to say, conventional characteristics of libraries. And most of those characteristics are shared by seed libraries and Wikipedia. But some of them are not. OK? Well, so what? Well, so what? This so what? OK? We're all familiar with the highly uh, visible and controversial efforts by Google to digitize tens of millions of books. There's lots of benefits, but many stakeholders were outraged by Google's characterization of this project as a library. So Sergey Brin, who has some relationship to Google, I forget what it was, um, wrote an op-ed in the New York Times saying it was a library to last forever. This is the Alexander Library, which will never burn down. And because he was emphasizing certain characteristics of the Google Books, that you could have improved access and so on and so on. Other people, notably Pamela Samuelson, said, no way, Jose, and wrote a rebuttal in the, in the Huffington Post that said that it is not a library. Not at all is it a library, because she was looking at the fact that Google had, had done some business things like trying to make money doing this, commercialization, you know, collecting data for, in order to have uh, personalized ads rather than having the library uh, criterion of not trying to preserving people's transactional data. Pamela Samuelson said that anyone aspiring to create a modern equivalent of the Alexandrian library would not have designed it to transform research libraries into strip malls. OK? So what's the problem here? Well, the problem is that the diagram makes it very clear what the problem is. The problem is we have two categories which overlap, OK? Business information collection and library collections. And the one you choose as an anchor frames how you view this thing. So now we can readily identify ways in which Google Books is, uh, has characteristics which are more like businesses, OK? Now, they had said, perhaps, that we are having a business service. Like, it's like an online bookshop, but we have a lot of free services. It might have been seen very differently by the average stakeholder. As, what a great thing. Google's going to give us some free service on top of their bookstore. Instead, it was like creating the library for all time. And that alienated a lot of people who had a different view of what a library was. So, Using an established category, like library, reinforces some of the conventional characteristics of these things, which are very deeply embedded in our culture and language. Library is a very important category to us. And so using it in a way, even when qualified, like the seed library, brings up that, that, that frame uh, and marginalizes typical, atypical characteristics of the thing you're trying to, or to, to characterize. So, Google Books might be a notorious example of this problem of finding the boundaries of an organized system, but it's not at all atypical. What's a natural history museum? If you think of the defining features of a natural history museum, you'll say, well, there are sort of dead animals preserved so we can look at them, how they looked when they were alive. OK? Well, this is kind of like a museum, but the animals are not dead yet. OK? So we changed one of the features. We have a museum of live animals rather than dead animals. And of course, what are the typical principles of organizing zoos? We organize them by habitat, by their biological taxonomy, you know, species, genus, so on. We put all the antelope-like things together. They run around the savanna habitat of the zoo. We have some constraints. We don't tend to put animals together that will eat each other in zoos. But otherwise, the principle is to let the animals exhibit semi-natural behaviors, which is a criterion which you not which we did not enforce in an animal theme park, where we say, you know, the animals should be trained and show they, they're organized, again, by certain principles, often biologically. But we tend to have less emphasis on letting them do their own thing. I mean, Shanwood does not jump through fire rings in the North Atlantic as a wild orca. OK? So it's sort of one feature off of the last category. Let's relax that requirement about letting the animals self-organize. Now let them self-organize for a while. Instead of having them forced to be in habitats that we control, let them be in their own habitats and self-organize, roaming around. Well, I was in a game park, I mean, a wild animal park a few years ago in South Africa, and I was driving around the Land Rover with the guide. And one of the other tourists in the, in the uh, Land Rover said to the, to the guide, who takes care of the sick animals? And the guide said, the lions. <laughs> All right. You know, there's no veterinarians like there are in zoos or wild animal theme parks. We're one feature off. You know, the wild animals don't have to 
aren't taken care of in the same way because we want to have more naturalistic outcomes. So we've seen theme parks with animal resources. Have any of you ever been to Colonial Williamsburg? It's kind of a people theme park. They call it a living history museum, right? It's a museum. That's what they call it, okay? So it's a museum or theme park, except it's having animals. We have people running around exhibiting trained behaviors. You know, human resources. We know what human resource organization looks like. You know, we teach it in business schools, right? So this is human resource organization. And of course, I'd rather be on this side than that side, right? But it's human resource organization. We know what this means. But these people are alive. Let's make them dead. <laughs> well, we're the organized principles in cemeteries. The same was as in real life, it turns out. We organized by kinship relationships, like we do in living families, by chronology, by religion, by socioeconomic class, by race. This is the way we organize people in life. We organize the same way in death. Okay? What? That's right. Okay. So there are some characteristics of the organization which we saw change from the last one, but we're now only one feature off from this. We've gone around the block. Okay? We're back where we started. We never made a big category change. One little feature at a time. And we managed to take a grand tour of the entire space of the iSchools practically. So the boundaries just aren't there. So something is fundamentally wrong here. Thinking about Categories. I mean, categories are important. They carry a lot of cultural, linguistic baggage. That's useful. But there might be something better here. So in addition to that category system, I've been proposing that we think of organizing systems as points in a multidimensional design space. So categories are kind of regions in this design space of organizing. So familiar categories are kind of design patterns that embody typical choices on some of those dimensions we just went through. What's being organized? How is it being organized? How much is it being organized? And so on. This is the good thing, I think, because what it does is says we can overcome the bias and conservatism inherent in familiar categories. We have a way of looking at multidimensional work that cuts across the categories, saying, what are your choice on these design dimensions rather than how library-like are you? And we have a vocabulary now for translating concepts and concerns into in and out of these disciplinary specific vocabularies. It makes it easier to do innovative stuff. Okay? If, if I think of organizing systems as points in this multidimensional space of possible organization, I think of that as kind of a map of organizing. We can now look at the white space between the crowded areas of that map and say, that's where we could have innovation take place. We haven't organized stuff that way yet. What would it take? What would the properties of an organized system be that could occupy that white space? What would it take in terms of technology, process, and policy innovation to let us organize like that? So it's a way to innovate now because you have a way to look at the missing organizations. So I've been thinking in terms of these five design dimensions for organized systems. What's being organized? Why is it being organized? How much? When? and by what means, what mechanisms, by people or by computational agents. And I will just briefly go through some of these design questions to show how this perspective uh, can apply broadly across the domains of the iSchools. So what's being organized? This is the fundamental question in every discipline, every, every activity of science and organizing. What are we trying to organize? What are the things of our domain? And a resource can be a thing in itself, or it can be a composite or aggregate thing with internal structure, and that poses questions about how to think about the granularity of the thing. So how many things are here? Well, it's when you schedule teams against each other, you have this is the one thing. The Giants are playing the 49ers today. That's one thing. But when you're saying, let me draft players for my team, there's 57 of them. When you're saying offense and defense, there's two things. Rookies and, and veterans, there's two things. Different kinds of positions, there's nine things. So again, the how many things there are is the fundamental question we can answer different ways. 
We also answer different ways in the bibliographic domain. A really important principle in the bibliographic domain is to find some level of abstraction to describe works. And we often describe things as particular items. This is, if I'm thinking of Macbeth, do I have a, a signed by Bill Shakespeare first folio 1603 edition, a, a rare item, or do I have a bunch of copies of the Penguin Shakespeare in the library shelves that I'm treating all the same? Or do I have you know, a bunch of movies and a bunch of plays and a bunch of books that are all about Macbeth, Macbeth influenced, and those are kind of an expression but in different media, an abstraction. Or I can say, you know what? Kurosawa wrote a Macbeth movie. It's called Throne of Blood, inspired by Macbeth. Is that part of Macbeth? Well, where do you draw the line and thinkingness of Macbeth? Really important question in library science about how to organize bibliographic collections and the relationship between bibliographic resources. We do, we do data modeling. How many things is this? Well, is it a blob of text or is it a lot of mixed content? Depends on my purpose. If I'm doing digital humanities, I want to think of it in terms of, of locations and times and actors and things like that, which I want to be well below the level of the text at the paragraph or chapter or book. We make a lot of choices about, the, about resources. We can say, um, we can distinguish them based on the domain of organization, uh, by their format, by their focus, or by their agency. And I'll go through some of these. I've already talked a lot about domain. I won't talk about that one anymore. But these, again, are an important dis distinction which cut across all the disciplines and the domains of the iSchools. This is a very conventional way to think about resources, contrasting physical and digital ones. This is the, started with Nicholas Negroponte talking about bits and atoms. It's increasingly important to think about whether things were born digital or whether they're digitized because there's a lot of design choices there and influences from our perspective, the nature and repertoire of the interactions you can have. The, amount of, the way you digitize really makes a huge difference because format matters, OK? Here's an interesting way to think about that. You could say I can have a format which is, separates content from presentation, or which doesn't, and which has a lot of explicit content or has none. So if I have a digital scan of a document, the blob in the lower left-hand corner, it's a blob of bits, no internal structure, and no separation of content and presentation. At the other extreme, I have an XML document or a database. Complete separation of document structure from presentation and lots of internal structure. An HTML page with a style sheet, lots of separation, not much useful internal structure, and so on. So we want to, where are I in this, in this design space of formats? Uh, uh, there's an important distinction I call resource focus, which I'm using because I want to get rid of the word metadata. Metadata is a narrow term. The more general problem is you have some resource is the primary one because it is the focus of our attention, and other resources are created which are describe them or add other additional information about that primary resource. They're description resources. They can be physical or, or, or digital. So if you have primary, phys primary, descriptive, physical, digital, we have four combinations. We're all familiar with physical descriptions of physical resources. That's the traditional library card catalog uh, for the books on the shelves. We could have an online catalog, which is a digital description of a physical resource. We could have a search engine, which is a digital description of a digital resource. Or we could have a QR code, which is a physical thing that points to a digital resource. Augmented reality is an example of a digital description of a physical resource. And again, I can look at this QR code. It could be on a billboard or on a document. Use my iPhone to recognize it and it takes it to a web page. So it's a physical description of a digital resource, so the inverse of the, of the online card catalog. Fantasy football. What's the resource in football? They're physical players. They play the game, right? And the statistics are their metadata, right? Wrong. In fantasy football, the players are the metadata. The descriptions of the players are the resources that are the primary focus of your activity. So we've inverted primary and, and description. In, in fantasy football, you're playing with the statistics. Those are the players on your team, the statistics. That's, that's, the, data, that's the metadata, and that's the data. That's why I don't like the word metadata anymore. It's primary and secondary focus. 
look at this issue a little more carefully. Again, the description is just some association of a resource with another one. Now that's traditionally, we aggregated those descriptions. So we could have card catalogs, online card catalogs. So we could have web search engine, which would give us a pile of, of descriptions. The, my search results is the aggregated results uh, pointing to a collection of resources. But there's no reason why they have to be aggregated. And when we disaggregate them, we have the semantic web now notion where we say, let's say each of those assertions could be a separate statement that could be then treated as a thing in its own right. Finally, let's look at resource agency. We can distinguish resources that are active from those which are passive, those which are operant and those which are operands. I always remember this by operants run around like ants. They're the active ones. Okay? Now, operants can create effects on their own. Most resources and organized systems are operant. They sit on the shelf waiting to be picked off the shelf. But we now have sensors and web-based services and information feeds which are operant resources that are now combined to implement business processes that have computation at, the, at, at their sources, sensing, communication, computational capabilities. Wonderful example in yesterday's New York Times. So we know about sensor networks and vineyards or your fast track. Yesterday's New York Times had a story. Some of you probably saw it. Swiss cows are now operant resources because they wander around the Swiss countryside with little things stuck in their uterus. And when they're ready to go into heat, the farm manager wants to know that because he wants to make sure he can do the right stuff with the farm, with the, with the animals, right? So essentially, the, the cows are now sexting each other. You know, SMS messaging about sex saying, comes now my time, man. Come on. All right? And it makes it, it'll make the farms more productive because they'll be able to never miss the estrous cycles of the animals like these two when they're wandering around. So now we have, cows are now smart cows, right? In the smart farm. It's a smart network of resources which are operants. Cow sexting. Okay, and another framework that we sort of think of things that resources have issues over time. So issue, we want to worry about persistence. This resource has to be around for a while. But it may, in fact, not really be effective at all those times. It may have a legislative, uh, an act that says between 1994 and 1995, this law is in place. Or it only becomes effective in 2004. That's effectivity. We have the question of provenance, which says, do we know the history of this thing in terms of its custody, the chain of custody of this resource? Do we keep track of all the important events with changes in possession, location, and ownership? That's important because authenticity, which is a question over time. Are you the resource you say to be, say you are? And this applies broadly across all organized system domains. For example, on the right we have a Chinese poem which has got the traditional uh, marks the provenance, the stamps of the person who owned the poem, the, the, the emperor or whoever it was who, who owned the poem, or the curator in the museum who owned the poem. Okay? And on the left, hey, I bought a Brad Pitt autograph. And I know it's authentic because it was signed by this guy, Robert Miller, and there's a star on there's a, there's a, I know it's authentic. Now, someone said, someone said that he could afford that signature, but I don't believe it because it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a signed document. But we, this is, we care about this. Different kinds of domains, museums and, you know, stars uh, autographs, but they both have the same issues about persistence and authenticity and provenance. New example this week from a student in my class. He says, my grandmother has lived 79 years in the same house and she's lived in seven different countries. All right, so we have this issue about authoritative names of countries, national boundaries. This woman has lived in Belgrade for 79 years and she's lived in seven countries. Okay? Interesting issues of effectivity there, right? Another dimension is why are we organizing it? We can have some generic reasons, but there's always more specific reasons for organizing, uh, more specific kinds of interactions to support. Um, some interactions are generic, can be done with any kind of resource, like you can look at it, access it, 
Other ones are more specific. Um, we can interact directly through mediated interaction, or you could be inter forced to interact only with copies of things. All sorts of different patterns here. Um, I could inventory these again. There's lots of different ones in different domains. We have like the, the copyright row of interactions, for example, with certain kinds of documents that are copy protected. Principles organization, another kind of design pattern. Much of organization is shaped by physical properties. Uh, we organize most simply by co-location. We put things in the same place that we want to use together. But uh, it's more interesting when you have multiple properties or when you have digital resources because you do things that are much more interesting that way because you're not as constrained by the affordances and properties of the physical resource. You could also use properties of the collection as a whole. So when we say I index this document, I can use Boolean search, which is based on properties of individual resource, or I can use weighted vector search, which is based on properties of the collection as a whole, inverse document frequency kind of things. Nice framework here is to look at whether the properties of the resources are intrinsic or extrinsic or static or dynamic. That is, are they fixed, inherent, or do they change over time, or are they arbitrary? So, for example, the author of an object, of a, of a document, is inherent and it is static. Its size of an object, physical object, presumably is relatively static. Uh, its data creation is static. But the name on it, I could have called it a glurp rather than a gorp. It's arbitrary. It's extrinsic but static. You don't change your name that often. Okay? And so on. So we have the different kinds of framework, two by two here. Look at my kitchen again. Well, I sort my pans, I nest them. That's an intrinsic static property of the resources. I sort them so they nest on the shelf. I spice rack, alphabetical order, that's extrinsic and static. If I worry about perishability and put my time to live date, put the milk in the front, it's going to go bad, that's an in intrinsic but a dynamic property. And if I say, you know what, I'm going to put things I'm using a lot these days, I'm into Chinese food in the front, that's an extrinsic and dynamic property. Or my roommates, we have to fight about where to put things, and that's an extrinsic dynamic property. But we do this in documents, too. The same framework applies. Author, date, published, that's an extrinsic static, intrinsic static property. The classification scheme is extrinsic and static. Its effectivity is dynamic and intrinsic. And its links to other documents is extrinsic and dynamic. So again, the, the frameworks apply broadly across different domains. This doesn't mean it's objectively good. It just has to be a principle. So this is one of my TAs last year. said, I organize my books by color. It makes the living room look better. It's like furniture or art. I said, will this scale for the Bancroft Library? So I don't care. <laughs> OK? We had a student several years ago who was a professional disc jockey. How do you organize your music? By, by artist, right? Classical versus jazz, jazz OK? Not Matt Earp. He organizes by beats per minute. Because <laughs> this shock is have to be able to, you know, what's it called? Segue, you know, transition between songs. So you have to know which ones are close enough to be able to do that, do that easily. So beats per minute is the principle of organizing for disc jockeys. How much is being organized? Again, not everything needs as much organization. It depends on how big the collection is, whether it's a Collection for all time, collection for your lifetime or for your project. Um, or you organize the resources you have or those which you might have. These are important questions which cut across domain. Librarians call it literary warrant. Other people call it different things. When are you organizing it? When it's created? When you add it to your collection? Just in time? Never? Well, we differ there. Some people organize just in case. They're very compulsively organizing. They want to invest heavily to avoid having uh, unexpected penalties at, at retrieval time. Other people say, you know what? I'll postpone organization. I'll be more efficient in my organization and only do it when I really need it. Now, of course, these are before and after, but it's better to show them in that direction. Okay? And finally, who are what's doing the organizing? Is it an author who presumably knows best about the intent why the resource exists in the first place? A professional organizer like a person who's a cataloger in a library or an archivist or someone who's trained to do it according to some systematic way. People 
tagging their photos on Flickr or saying plus one or not minus one on Yelp or Facebook. That's organization. Users in institutional context, Enterprise 2.0, when you have, you know, build the corporate wiki. Well, when you say, run the search engine, run the text mining classifier, that's the computational classification, the machine's doing the organizing. So to summarize, I think this concept of organized system unifies a vast body of design and analysis practice across the high school disciplines. I think that thinking in terms of dimensions rather than categories uh, overcomes a lot of inertia. This gives us the more generative, forward-looking way to, to think about innovation while preserving the traditional uh, theory and practice and enables conversations between people who couldn't talk together before. And I'm teaching the course this way now. So in fact, if you, if you were alumnus from five years ago, you wouldn't recognize this course because now it talks about organizing systems. And I'm looking at, at you, Sarah. <laughs> you would not recognize this syllabus. Organizing systems, foundation, activities, resources, resource description. This is not the course you took only just a couple of years ago because we're really thinking about things differently now. Now, we'll talk a little bit about the, the collaboration and the e-books and that sort of stuff, which, which is implied by this. So this book began as my lecture notes from the course I was teaching, but I realized that, that by definition I couldn't do it all because I don't know all the fields. So I started enlisting people who did know more to collaborate with me. And the book is now the product of lots of discussion with lots of people, both here and in other schools. Uh, the manuscript is being used here for the second time, North Carolina for the second time, Humboldt for the first time, second time soon, Kentucky, and is being considered this next semester at a number of other high schools, Michigan, Illinois, and so on. Uh, now, we're publishing a book that will be a traditional printed book of sort coming out in a few months with me as the editor and my 12 or 13 co-authors. Uh, chapter by chapter, essentially that way. That's why it's an edited book of sorts. It will be a traditional printed book, but it will also be available as an HTML book for free on the web. And in one or more ebook formats. Now, we already have the easy ones. I mean, I can push a button and generate one of these, um, which, you know, the kind of thing you get when you want to run your, on your Kindle or your EPUB 2, and I can then jump around the table of contents, and I can make the, the, the fonts bigger or smaller and other kind of pretty simple stuff, but that's not interesting to me. Because, in some sense, the transdisciplinary character of this project implies something more ambitious. And that is that, can we have a book which is customizable at when it's being used? And so the idea was, if you have this book which you write everything that everyone needs, it becomes this very large book. The union of all disciplines is a very big book. Instead you say, let me write the intersection of all disciplines and then have a lot of additional material which is tagged by discipline. So, the print book has this much text and this much endnotes. 20% of the text is in endnotes, tagged by discipline. It says this is a computing footnote, this is a law footnote, this is a business footnote, and so on. And so you can ignore it, because you, you don't have to look at it, but if you want to see, you can see the disciplinary footnote, so you can see more computer science, for example. Ebooks will have that, but also have other kinds of channels, like highlighting and annotation and self-study and things like that, and you'll see that that you can have, again, yeah, you can have more of that kind of stuff to make the book more personalized. So, for example, in the main text, you'll say something like this. You have a small number of things. Co-location is probably good enough to organize them. You when you put them on the shelf, your spices, a small number of spices, that's good enough. You can find the one you want pretty quickly. There's a computer science footnote next to that. It says, yes, but. We're talking about analysis of algorithms, aren't we? Right? Is this log n or, or, or linear, right? Based on the way you've organized stuff. You can say different organizations will have different retrieval functions. That's the literature which is going to be relevant to you because you're a computer scientist. Connect the dots to computer science from this simple statement about what's needed to organize your collection. So a way to have more texture for that discipline in the context of the, the base book. So let's look at a design prototype. Here you see essentially the next generation ebook we're building. The usual stuff, look, we can have, over here we can have the table of contents and navigate, we can have some notes and so on. But we see that these little markers here are the tagged endnotes. So if I select this little endnote here, uh, 
I've inserted this text. And so in fact, you know what? It actually does work. You ready for this? All right. So what we've done here, we've said, we just added an additional level of, of information for someone who wanted that discipline to have more of that. So we can tag, we're tagging by computer science, library science, cognitive science, law, business, and then additional just more, um, sort of more detail about citations and so on. We can have highlighting. This is when a, a reader can say, I'm going to highlight this. But I have in my chapters a section called Key Ideas. That's the professor's highlighting. So you can compare your highlighting with the professor's highlighting. Okay? So we could say, I could put a little exercise in the book saying, stop and think. Hit this button, and now you have a little stop and do an exercise in the, in, as you read this book. So we have a, a channel now for doing this book as a self-study uh, activity. Again, with, this is obviously a multidisciplinary, multiple school project, and so we have to support that somehow. We're doing a lot of interesting stuff there. We have a website called disciplineoforganizing.org where we have one chapter available to the public, and then if you, if you talk to me nice, you can get the other chapters and other things, other resources. Uh, we have a Dropbox with lecture notes, exams, assignments, pictures, all kinds of other stuff we share. We have a video channel. Thank you, Cal football. <laughs> you might know that we have a first year student in the master's program who plays for the Cal football team. He practices during my lectures. So he can't miss the core class, so they send a person to record all my lectures, and now they're available online um, <laughs> because I want to share them back. Right? So you want to play my multimedia description lecture? There it is. We talk about the Getty AAT. Okay? So again, I'm trying to make the book a kind of platform for sharing resources about this, this, this concept. We have a bi-monthly conference call, one of them's tomorrow, and we are designing a collaborative publishing system probably based on, on some, something like Git as a back end to be able to have customized publishing of different, different books with different configuration of these things. So this project, as you can tell, is pretty ambitious, but that's because we have lots of people involved in it. I've had three faculty collaborators. 11 high school master students, two PhD students from UCLA who've written parts of this book. Uh, there are a dozen people who have worked on cover design, graphic design, bibliography, ebook design. 12 TAs over the last three years have sweated with this. 100 students have put up with this evolving, what's going on? The lecture changed today. You changed your, your definitions today, Bob. Um, and thank you to Dean Saxony and the faculty for giving me a place to do intellectual experimentation. Thank you very much. Brian. Okay, so um, I'm interested in the idea that we could get at something the high schools have in common and that it might be this discipline of organizing. Um, and to preview, I want to know where I fit in. Um, but <clears throat> I, I think the answer is uh, you, a recent example that you just had up there. Uh, when you clicked on the computer science tab and you get more information about a given topic. Um, so if I'm organizing something and it might involve sorting or searching through things, then the computer scientist who knows about algorithms has something very valuable to tell me, uh, namely that some kinds of algorithms are faster than others and, and things that are relevant. Right. And, and so they can work with an organizer to talk to them about the constraints that they live with. Or somebody who uh, is knowledgeable about sort of the technological capabilities, uh, you know, of things uh, would be useful. Somebody who's an expert in storage might have something to tell you about how to design your database. Because if storage is fast, then your, if your database has to write constantly, that's fine. If storage is slow, you might want to design it differently. Uh, those kind of things. And as you know, I, I do law and policy, and I think I'm comparable to those other examples in that whatever laws govern a given situation or whatever policies are in place act as constraints on how things are organized. Uh, the effectivity uh, line that you had up in one of the slides is maybe also relevant here. Sometimes a particular law is in effect, other times it may not be. Is that the rule uh, for those who study law and policy in this uh, picture of the iSchool world, or is there something more to it? Okay, so um, the choice of flavors or channels we have now is basically 
largely shaped by what I know and what I can get people to tell me that I can understand. But the mechanisms we're building are completely, completely general. So in fact, if you taught this course, or if someone who was an expert in healthcare informatics taught this course, or someone who's expert in archiving taught this course, they could write their own flavors and add their own channels to this book. So we're part of trying to develop a kind of curatorial publishing model where we can have some way to add, add channels to particular places. Now, our current thinking says we should have the, the backbone should stay fixed for a year or two, so we have places to hang those things that doesn't go away. Um, and maybe that's like an addition. Second edition, you then say, well, let's reorganize the book based on what things have been published since then. But the idea is that um, a school should be able to have, maybe the, it could be the North Carolina channel, to have your particular stuff that makes sense for your particular school. Again, so the mechanism says create your channel or create an existing channel and add to it. So we're working on how that's going to work technically, but in terms of conceptualization, we think channels are vehicles for customization and they're pretty open. So uh, I would like, I mean, I, my hope is that as people use this book, they will contribute examples and, and things which, which then become and notes that are tagged by discipline in some sense. I mean, part of the reason we have a lot, of, a lot of notes here is because I was worried about not looking credible to people. So I would send this to my friends in library science or computer science or cognitive science. They would give me tons of feedback saying, wow. And then I, if I ever tried to write the book that way, the book got bigger and bigger and bigger, making everybody happy. I had to make it, and I said, I can't do this. I can't make everybody happy because then I, some people are confused. So I said, let me just keep your stuff and make it into footnotes. And I was like, I can reuse that stuff in a way which is, which is helpful. Now, in fact, I don't want to beg the question that people only look at their own channel. So you may want to read computer science because you know all the law. You're already a lawyer, all right? So it's an interesting study question about which channels do you end up looking at. So we could instrument the books and say maybe this configuration of channels, some flavors go together better than others. That's the cuisine. Business and law maybe go together as a cuisine. Bad metaphor, I know. OK. <laughs> but we don't know. This is basically could be a research platform for for that as well. But right now it's just me and a couple of pioneers at North Carolina and, and uh, Kentucky and, and uh, other places. So we have a long way to go yet. But I, think that, I hope you see the vision we got here about what we're trying to accomplish with a multidisciplinary book with a kind of a multidisciplinary publishing and delivery platform around it. It seems to me, Brian, just to take your question a little further, the, the project you, that you're doing with Michael Listener is exactly a project about organizing. And so you can actually see that, isn't it? So that people can have access to legal cases. So Yeah, I mean, I, we, have, we are trying right now to figure out how to plug in uh, technology demonstrations from the Information Organization Lab. So that students, and there's a, we have a course here where students do little apps of various kinds to demonstrate things. Uh, you might have a a text summarizer which looks at a document and says, give me the best 10 keywords for it. That could be plugged into the point in the book which talks about you know, good descriptions for text. You know, show different algorithms, how they would give different words for the same block of text and things like that. So again, launching those apps, we want to have a well-defined way to do things like that. Well, I, I like many things about what you're doing in terms of organizing around core concepts and so on. I think that's really important. And if you can bring that understanding to the iSchools, that's great. It, it, there has been a lack of coherence to what their thinking is as a community, and I think bringing this coherence in. The one thing I would ask, though, is that you look more at what's already been discovered and discussed about these things. That um, you know, I, I'll, I'll give this to you afterwards, but it's an article about when I was a student here at Berkeley and I was actually asked to teach, which you probably can't do nowadays, but in those days you did. And I, I taught essentially what you're talking here. And I'm thrilled to hear this. <laughs> I'm I mean, thrilled. It, it, good instructors never have limited their discussion of the organization of knowledge to specific domains or specific conceptions of them. There are a lot of people who do limit them, but the people who understand information science do the broader conceptualization, and there is a lot that's known that I'm not picking up okay. on some of what I you're mean, saying. I, 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 there's 150,000 words in the book, so I mean, I can't just do it all in, in 45 minutes, but uh, I agree a lot, again, but I go to an I conference and I feel like I'm in the Lost Tribes. 
There's 12 different dialects. Um, and the textbooks that we all use, we're, we're all told the typical textbook package in an high school is Arlene Taylor's nth edition organization of information, which is very library science-y, and then some IR textbook. And like, make these things work together. Computer science textbook and a library science organization book, they don't make a course. And that's what everyone is well, using right now, those two books. Yeah, that's not how so, it should be. I said, I got to do something different. And I got to say, let me find a way to talk and make it into one coherent thing. And again, I, this is version one. So we'll see where it is. And but please tap into what's already known. I have talked to so many people in so many places. I'm trying, and I'm, I look forward to reading your paper. OK, just to follow up, though. So if the computer scientist and the the, the law and policy person both get included just because they have something valuable to say about constraints upon any you know system of organization that I'm worried that maybe that captures too much or maybe the high schools won't be upset about that they'll say we're so multidisciplinary we're everything um, uh, but right I think the same case that I made about the computer scientist and the lawyer could be made about the sociologist the econ the economist the the maybe the anthropologist in certain circumstances, the biologist, you know. And so there's nothing that's out of scope. And is that a problem? This is a core book, not the core book. There could be other textbooks that also find other intersections of the iSchool. But this is one intersection of the iSchools, no question about it. There may be a, a law and policy intersection of the iSchool, which I can't cover in this book very well, because it's sort of a, not, not the core of my focus. But I'm trying to, to get at this one thing, which is that at the core course, the sort of technology foundation, conceptual foundation course, which I teach, as opposed to the course which you teach, which is the law and policy course, or the course on social organization, which someone else teaches, this is an intersection which is underdeveloped. That's the case I'm trying to make here today. There may be other intersections, but this is definitely one of them. I think it's too hot. I don't say stuff about that anymore. <laughs> I used to. I don't know how to do it anymore. Hi. Um, OK. OK. Um, uh, could you comment just briefly on the changing value of, uh, of, of organized data over time? Uh, just uh, it's you kind of hinted yeah. a little bit yeah. about it. Could you some okay. some bits of data or, or some bits of information are more valuable today than perhaps they will be in the future and vice versa? Well, one thing that's definitely happening is that we used to have a clear separation of organization from, from, from retrieval. We would organize stuff and then we would go do something with it. All right, so it made it clear that you could invest up front and then there was some benefit for downstream. Now, when you have an internet where you are constantly you know, your selecting search results is going to redefine the weighting function on those documents for relevance. And when you're, you're plus one and you're tagging everything else, the, the, the lines are blurry now. So it's much harder to know what the benefit of any activity of organization is because it's being done so much simultaneously, right? So uh, part of that meant that it's just harder to say what is organizing separate from what is sort of using. You have to see it as a system that you organize in order to have some interaction, but it's kind of a dynamic system. So uh, you have to say the system has to be maintained over time, and maybe some things will change over. But I don't think I can look anymore at saying, what's the value of this thing in isolation? Because it's, it's in part of systems and stuff now in a way that I didn't see before. Maybe that didn't answer your question, but. Well, uh, uh, it, it actually did. And, and I'm also interested in the changing value. Um, some information will be very critical in the future. We have no idea what that oh, is. Oh, yeah, yeah, OK. The, the, uh, how do we organize systems so this information is not just available, but also use in useful forms? Uh, yeah, these are challenges. One thing that I'm, I'm really seeing as an important emerging area is preservation of scientific data. Uh, in particular, we have underestimated how difficult it is to keep, keep the context around this needed to actually make use of data over time. Because um, I have a joke prop in my office. I have my master's thesis data on an 8-inch floppy disk in my office. Uh, I couldn't imagine. I had to go to the computer museum to read my data, right? But that problem is, you know, magnified 
thousandfold in, in scientific data we, or large data collections because we have to worry about configurations of software and hardware and expertise and stuff, which is, we can't preserve right now. We don't know how to do it. So that's, I think, a real problem. A real problem. But I think part of it is that we have people who've done this in archives. We need to talk to the database people. They just haven't talked before, you know? So there's kind of this, this cross the disciplinary boundary. I don't know what I said, but archive is usually like ingesting things to the archive. That word just scares me. Ingest to the archive. It sounds so Borgian, you know? That's one of the words they used, ingest. So it's hard to talk to someone who uses words like ingest. I don't want to stay away from them, you know? Don't ingest me, right? I'm done, if you're done. <laughs>